Chen. Say their names where? of America's police forces. Uh, by Radley Balco. Chapter five, I believe. I'll share this live. Chapter 5, the 1970s, Pinch and Retreat. Page 81. Drug people are the very vermin of humanity. They are dangerous. Occasionally we must adopt their dress and tactics. Miles Ambrose, head of Nixon's Office of Drug Abuse and Law Enforcement. Sam Irvin was an unlikely civil liberties hero, known for his bushy, high-arching eyebrows, the avuncular senator from Morgantown, North Carolina, was the prototype backwoods bumpkin who passed himself off as just a simple country lawyer. Right before unleashing the devastating argument that crushed his opponent and won the day, in a thick, jolly draw, Irvin was a decorated war, World War I veteran who earned a silver star, two purple hearts, and a distinguished service cross during his mission as an infantryman in France. When he returned home, the whip smart veteran quickly ascended the ranks of North Carolina politics. When Democratic Senator Clyde Huey died in 1954, Irvin was sitting on the North Carolina Supreme Court. Governor William Olmsted asked him to fill the vacant seat, and he accepted. Sam Irvin would remain a U.S. Senator for 20 years. What, what many would come to see as contradictions or surprises and Irvin as a public figure were in fact his way of balancing the reflection and values of and his faith in prohibited teaching evolution in the state schools. Irvin found the law embarrassing. Though Irvin was a Democrat, he and Nixon were often on the same side of the 1960s culture wars. Irvin largely supported Nixon's effort in Vietnam. He also opposed Brown v. Board of Education, though he later changed his mind in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Good morning, Ari.
birds are loud in them. <laughs> yeah, I hear them chirping in them. <laughs> no coppers tonight. Okay, how about, I think that sound better. That should sound better. Okay. Uh, uh, chapter 5 of The Rise of the Warrior Cop by Radley Blanco. Pinch and Retreat. 1970s. Pinch and Retreat. And this is a quote from Mile Ambrose, head of Nixon's Office of Drug Abuse and Law Enforcement. Drug people are the very vermin of humanity. They are dangerous. Occasionally, we must adopt their dress and tactics. That, again, that is a quote from Miles Ambrose, head of Nixon's Office of Drug Abuse and Law Enforcement. Okay, Chapter 5, page 81. Sam Irvin was an unlikely civil liberties hero. Known for his bushy, high-arcing eyebrows, the Avunat... Hmm. The Avu na Avu nuclear Avu I've never seen that word. Avu nuclear senator from Morgantown, North Carolina, was a prototype backwoods bumpkin who passed himself off as just a simple country lawyer. Right before unleashing the devastating argument that erupt the devastating argument that crushed his opponents and won the day. In a thick, jolly draw, he dispensed folksy, an folksy anecdotes, Bible verses, and righteous indignation. And in the next breath, would drop quotes from Shakespeare, Aristotle, Kipling, or Thomas Wolfe. Born in 1896, Irvin was a decorated World War I veteran who earned a silver star, two purple hearts, and a distinguished in a distinguished service service squash during his during his commission as an infantryman in France. When he returned home, the whip smart veteran quickly ascended quickly ascended the ranks of North Carolina politics. When Democratic Senator Clyde 
Clyde Hoey. Clyde Hoey died in 1954. Irvin was sitting on the North Carolina Supreme Court. Gov. William. Governor William Um Um said. Governor William Um said asked him to fill the vacancy, and he accepted. Sam Irvin would remain a U.S. Senator for 20 years. What many would come to see as contradictions or surprises in Irvin as a public figure were in fact his way of balancing a collection of values, a collection of values drawn from his faith. His constitution, let me wait for this ambulance to pass by real quick. Let me share the slide. Something been uh, okay, let me share this live real quick. Oh, it just started. It just started. Probably right when I got. Okay. Okay. Who's the fuck? What? Okay, let's not get into this. Let's not get into this. Okay, let's no, nah, let's not get into this. <laughs> okay. Where where were we? Okay, right here. Right here. I'll start this paragraph over. We are reading The Rise of the Warrior Cop by Radley Block Blocko Manko. What many would come to see as contradictions or surprises in Irvin as a public figure were in fact his way of balancing a collection of values drawn from his faith, his constitution, his heritage, the more his heritage, the more what is it? The mores and traditions of his religion and his scholarship. Though a deeply religious man, for example, Irvin success successfully led an effort in the North Carolina legislature to defeat a law that would have prohibited teaching of uh, teaching evolution in the state schools. Oh, so that would hold on. Let me just make sure I read that right. Irvin successfully led an effort in the North Carolina legislature to defeat a law that would have prohibited teaching evolution in the state schools. Irvin found the law embarrassing. Though Irvin was a Democrat, he and Nixon were often on the same side of the 1960s culture wars. Irvin largely supported Nixon. Irving largely supported Nixon's efforts in Vietnam. He also opposed Brown vs. Board of Educa Board Brown vs. Board of Education, though he later changed his mind and the 1964 Civil Rights Act. He was a signatory of the Southern Manifesto, which accused the Supreme Court of overstepping its authority on integration and breaching state sovereignty. Irvin even reversed course on the integration at about the time the Nixon administration made degrees. Irvin even reversed, reversed course on integration at about the same time, the Nixon administration made desegregating public schools a Justice, a Justice Department priority. Indeed, by the time Nixon ran for president in 1964, Irvin appeared to be precisely the sort of God and country, law and order Southern Democrat Nixon was hoping to, was hoping to court with his campaign. The two also shared a contempt for the Warren Court. For the Warren Court. In the nineteen fifty seven case, Mallory v. United States, the court ruled at the court ruled as inadmissible the confession of a subject who had been interrogated for seven hours before he was notified of his rights or given a preliminary hearing. In response, Irvin took to the floor of the US State Senate of the US Senate, I'm sorry. Irvin took to the floor of the U.S. Senate to defend the integrity of law enforcement officers. Irvin complained that the courts had perverse 
courts had per the courts had perversely decided that criminals needed protection from law enforcement more than society needs protection from criminals. Again, this goes back to. Hold on, give me one second. Again, this goes back to uh, everything really, really been reading. The common thread is how people treat criminals, or as soon as you're labeled a criminal, you lose all these rights. And this is uh, this is uh, North Carolina the said, and they're talking about this that. He'd rather protect. Uh, he'd rather protect his his society from these criminals than protect the criminals from his society. Let's see. Okay, I got a little bit off track. Okay. So then the next sentence is, it was a speech that Nixon himself might have given on the campaign trail 10 years later. The Nixonites, then, would be, a st- would be struck dumb when Sam Irvin emerged in the early 1970s not only as Nixon's most formidable Watergate nemesis on Capitol Hill, but also as the angriest, loudest, and most powerful critic of Nixon's crime policy. Even more surprising, he would beat them. Thanks to Irvin, the Castle Doctrine stayed afloat for about another decade before being submerged by the 1980s war on drugs. Attorney General John Mitchell and his subordinates began their big legislative crime push in the summer of 1969. They found plenty of willing help on Capitol Hill. In both chambers, in both chambers, Nixon administration allies and crime hawks introduced a flurry of bills containing sweeping new provisions. When Sanford law professor and criminologist Herbert Packer asked the Justice Department just how many crime excuse me, I'm sorry, when Sanford law professor and criminologist Herbert Packer asked the Justice Department professor, asked, asked, I'm sorry, asked the Justice Department just how many crime bills there were. One official replied in a letter, I leave it to you to make the count. In October 1970, in, that, in an October 1970 essay for the New, for the New York Review of Bo- uh, Books, rather, he tried. Packer counted 12 bills that came directly from the White House plan and eight more introduced independently that the White House supported. Packer counted at least four Senate and five House committees claiming jurisdiction over some version of a crime bill. And that wasn't counting the that wasn't counting the appropriations committee in each chamber. And because two bodies wouldn't pass identical versions of any bill there would also be a slew of con- of conference committees to sort out there would also be a slew of conference committees to sort out all the differences it seems unlikely that all this overlapping legislative ac- that all this overlapping legislative activity was planned but it had been but it had the benefit of making any organ- any organized opposition to the bills rather difficult the no knock the no knock raid came up in two bills. The first was a omnibus omnibus crime control act, which authorized which authorized no knock raids, preve- preventive pre- preventative detention, expanded wiretapping, night raids, and other powers in federal investigations. That bill is also. That bill was also split up. The portion including preventative detention, preventative detention, hit the House 
hit the House Judiciary Committee in October 1969, while another version had to, while another version headed to the same committee in the Senate, chaired by Irvin. When the when the bill hit Irvin's desk, he couldn't believe what he saw. The senator filed. I'm sorry. It is. He was right about the birds. He was right about the birds. The senator fired an early shot. The friend. Okay, let's go. The senator fired an early shot across the appendix bow when he when he called the preventative detention proposal. We called the preventative detention proposal desperate and tyrannical, and added that the very idea of eliminating bail repudiates our traditional concept of liberty. What does it mean by eliminating bail? Eliminating cash bail? Or eliminating bail? Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Eliminating cash bail is... What is that? That is a good thing. That is a good thing. The Nixon am- administration was gobsmacked. Irvin had supported the Rub- Irvin had supported the Republicans' election year crime package just a year earlier. He was an influential voice in the Senate, especially given his position on the Judiciary Committee. They were counting on his support, and he had just lashed out. And he had just lashed out at the centerpiece of their crime strategy. The White House regrouped and decided and said to put its initial push behind the crime bill aimed specifically at Washington, D.C. No knock raids were in that bill, as were preventative detention. This bill also limited probation and suspended sentences for some crimes. Uh, this bill, the bill also eliminated probation and suspended sentences for some crimes, imposed mandatory life sentences for others, and broadly expanded wiretapping authority. So the end of uh, probation and uh, suspended sentences for some sentences, for some crimes, I rather. It's like a... Uh, It's almost like, all right, fine, we'll ride this in. That seems like the compromise. That seems like the only one that doesn't fit the rest of them. Okay. Keep going. The bill allowed the police, the bill allowed police to conduct on-the-spot urinalysis tests during drug raids, allowing them to seize anything they found in a raid. They had been limited to only to season only the items that had been listed in the search warrant affidavit, and remove the restriction requiring police to be certain that the evidence they were looking for would be found before they could raid a home at night. And this goes back into I can't remember. I can't remember the uh, sometimes the end of policing and the new Jim Crow. They kind of all uh, I forget which stats are from which. But it was talking about uh, when the police come, when they do a search and they find drugs, they take the drugs, they take the money, they take these things, and they uh, they can make a profit off them. They can, who knows what they're doing with that, with those drugs, or with that money? I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if a story came out about them taking it, taking taking it home. Really, I wouldn't be surprised if that's some of their bonuses. Okay. Let's, let's get back going. Let's get back going. Um, let's see. Where were we? Where were we? Okay. Alright, here we go. Here we go. 
Um, before they had only been limited to seizing only items that had been listed in the search warrant affidavit and removed their restrictions or pleased to be certain that the evidence that they were looking for would be found when they could do a raid at home at night. At a home at night. Since Nixon and Mitchell were the most interested since, since Nixon and Mitchell were most interested in quickly accumulating legislative victories on the law and order issues that had won them the election. The major advantage of the D.C. bill was that an early, at least early in the process, excuse me, that at least early in the process, it could be routed against the unexpected. It, it could be routed around the unexpected obstacles of Sam Irvin and his Judiciary Committee. Instead, the Washington bill began at the House and Senate committees that oversaw the District of Columbia. In the House, that committee was chaired by Rev. by Representative John McMillan, a good old boy conservative. Southern... a good old boy Southern... I'm sorry. Robert, Representative... John McMillan, a good old boy conservative Southern Democrat who had once sent out had once sent a truckload of watermelons to the black mayor of Washington, D.C. He'd be an ally. So that's, I never, that's nuts. In the Senate, the D.C. Oversight Committee was chaired by, Sen- by Senator Joy Tidings, a Democrat from Maryland. Though Tidings was one of the more liberal members of the Senate, he faced a tough re- re-election in the 19th, in 1970. Give me one second. Okay. It's my fault, my fault. He, t- he faced a tough re-election in 1970. Maryland was home to a large excuse me Maryland was home to a large white wealthy batch of DC suburbs and many of those sub- many of those suburbanites worked in Washington if they hadn't been if they hadn't been mugged themselves they probably knew of someone who had at the very least they had read the press accounts of the city's crime problems the tougher on crime Joe Tidings could be the tougher on crime Joe Tidings could look, the better his prospects for re election. This is so crazy. I feel like every um nearly every book we have read so far has had their own uh, a version of a politician feeling as if they needed to be perceived as tough on crime. Hey, they're doing their uh, one committee or not one committee, one where there was uh, then then presidential candidate Bill Clinton feeling like he needed to be tough on crime. Or uh, I should go back and find his name, but in locking up our own, the uh, Baltimore mayor. The former Baltimore mayor, uh, O'Malley, yeah, I, know, I believe his last name was O'Malley, feeling like he needed to be tough on crime, to This right here, which are, uh, what's his name? Joe Tidings feels like in order to be reelected, he needed to have the appearance, needed to be perceived as being tougher on crime. Tidings committee reported out to a crime package of more than three, of more than three hundred pages. It included court reorganization, no knock raids, and prevented, preventative detention, allowing raiding cops to administer, administer on the spot urine tests, tougher sentencing guidelines, and an absurd proposal to let prosecutors appeal acquittals. When Irvin learned of those provisions, when Irvin learned of those provisions, 
he demanded they be removed or it hid him out any effort to kill the bill entirely. Most of them were taken out, or at least were narrowed. Preventative detention was removed entirely and reintroduced as a separate bill. The no-knock provision stayed in, but was slightly altered to require police to show a substantial, prob- a substantial probability that evidence would be destroyed if they were to make themselves known before entering. The change was mostly cosmetic, but at least appeared to make, the, uh, to make no-knock warrant more difficult to obtain. In December 1969, the package easily p- passed the full Senate. Perhaps because the idea still wasn't largely understood outside members of the Nixon administration and a few state legislators. I'm sorry, I need to sneeze, I need to sneeze. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Okay. Where are we? Where are we? Let's start this over. Perhaps the idea still wasn't largely understood. Members of the Nixon administration and a few state legislators and Rockefeller administration officials in New York there was a little objection to the no-knock provision, even from Irvin, but the minor change to the bill's language will later become very important. Hold on, I need to stop this for a second. I need to stop this.